perspective. Welcome to this recording of a live AML Gray Matters webinar broadcasted on 12th January 2022. My guest in studio was Foster Davis, a certified Chief Information Security Officer. This recording is one hour and 12 minutes. I do hope you find it informative. Uh, my name is Foster Davis. I, I spent about 15 years in the active U.S. Navy here in the United States, yeah. uh, both on the high seas and in cybersecurity. I've led our nation's premier hackers uh, in actually hacking ourselves to make right. ourselves more secure. Uh, also in my career, I've been an adjunct professor at the U.S. Naval Academy in cybersecurity. I'm also a certified chief information security officer, and I'm a co-founder of, of my company, Breach Bits. And what we do is we help people understand cyber risk in simple ways, uh, predominantly with our cyber risk score that we call Breach Risk Score. And the way we know how to score and help communicate risk is because we are actually hackers and risk managers. Mm -hmm. And what I hope you take away from who I am is I'm a bit technology. I am very much business and mission oriented, mm -hmm. and I'm very much interested in the fusion between those. And so for those out here who are technical, uh, I, I identify with you. For those that are business, board, I identify with you. Right. So. Right. And just so you know how Foster and I did meet, um, we're trialing his system uh, for Silo. Um, and for those of you who don't know me, my name is Kimberly Smith. I am the co-founder of Silo Compliance System, and I am a former AML compliance officer and money laundering reporting officer. And I, I worked both in the Caymans and in um, London. Um, I am currently now in the U.S. Um, but that's my background. And of course, we uh, are trialing um, Foster's system as well. And it came in very, very handy in December when the log uh, there was a vulnerability. Was it a zero day vulnerability? Yes. It okay, was. yeah, a very serious uh, vulnerability was was kind of mentioned in the media, and of course me, but not being a technical person, um, we do have a cybersecurity you know uh, person here on our team. He just happened to be out sick for three weeks. Right. Uh, very, very sick too. So it wasn't like I could give him a call and say, hey, can you just kind of help out right now? Okay. Um, and it was your email that went out to all your clients that helped me go, oh, I really do need to sort this out. And then I was able to call our developers and then with them work with vendors as well and um, assure us that we didn't have any vulnerability or any risk to that particular uh, vulnerability. That's, that's um, great. I'm glad to hear that. So yeah, no, so that was because the way your email was, it kind of immediately guided me. So I found that extremely helpful, um, not being a technical person myself. Okay, so we do have 72% uh, um, concerned about their cybersecurity. So I think this is very topical. Um, and 20 for six are unsure, they're still learning. So that's why they're here. So um, that's, that's wonderful. Thank you for joining us. I'm gonna move, I'm gonna hide this. So I, I really should have somebody uh, managing slides in the background. Uh, hide that and I am going to move forward. So a little bit of housekeeping before we do begin. Uh, this is not legal advice. I am not a lawyer and neither is neither are you, right? I am not a lawyer. <laughs> no, I'm not a lawyer. All right. Uh, and then none of this is jurisdiction specific. This is just a very general uh, casual conversation. Uh, and, uh, we do expect to be about one hour. We will have a Q&A at the end. Um, there are, for those of you who are here for certificates of participation or, or attendance, uh, they are auto-generated and you, they will be in your email about an hour after the live event. Um, there are some handouts as well. So if you can navigate to your, um, I guess it's a little dashboard or navigation tool, uh, there is a little section called handouts and there's, there's four of them. Uh, we have uh, top five cyber risk tips uh, from, from BreachBits. Um, information about silo. Uh, there's some information about a cyber assessment class that's happening uh, on, on January 27th, because I do know some of you are looking for certification. So that is a, an exam uh, required class. So please uh, take a moment to uh, download those handouts and save them as well. And, um, and, and you can review them after the event. Uh, next slide is uh, disclaimers. And when it comes to cybersecurity, there's never zero risk. Right. Um, and I know some managers 
sometimes really want I want 100 percent assurance that we're okay. Mm -hmm. And you've said, well, we right, um, zero defect uh, mentality is uh, it's not only is it unhelpful, it can actually be dangerous because uh, and so right, it, you like driving a car. Mm -hmm. There's always some risk. But we we got we want to understand the risk, and and that's certainly true. Anything you know you may hear me talk about, um, don't please don't hear that as me saying there's zero risk of something. Right. So uh, so do please understand that um, after you leave that this this uh, webinar today. Okay. I don't know why this keeps going backwards. There we go. Are you a target? That's probably the first question people are, are waking up with right now. Am I a target? Um, right. What do you, I mean. So, yes, it's a short answer, but maybe right. not as high level of a target as somebody else. And, and as I answer many of these questions, they're, they're going to come from me as either a risk manager, uh, a business leader, um, and a hacker, perhaps mm -hmm. roll all into one. And in this question, I, I really think through the, the perspective of a hacker. And, and it's important, as Sun Tzu says, know thy enemy. And so as I consider my enemy, am I a target? Well. Hackers think of it in in two ways, um, and I uh, they can see these slides. And yeah. so as, as they read here, we think of it as as there's two major types. There's there's uh, targets of opportunity. So there are some hackers out there that are just going through cyberspace, happening upon whatever looks like a easy target. Right. There are others that specifically want to target certain organizations. Um, I will talk about this in a ransomware context here because okay. ransomware is very dangerous and the ransomers are very good today and what they will tend to do is target a company and if you are trying to affect a ransom you look for somebody that can pay a ransom mm -hmm. and so what i have seen is that a targeted attack for ransom a company that has perhaps just or is undergoing a merger and acquisition where there's a lot of change happening. Mm -hmm. Change presents opportunity for an attacker. Yeah. But also mergers and acquisition usually means that money is changing hands. So it's easier, number one, I know money is there, mm -hmm. but also the movement of money is not something unusual. Right. So, so are you a target? Yeah, <clears throat> and I like that idea because uh, when you're talking about mergers and acquisitions, again, you might have staff changes, staff responsibility changes. Um, some people might be let go that did something. They, I talk about the IT team. Um, You're merging security and IT. Exactly. Um, and I can see that, well, Joe used to do that. You know, Joe used to do the patches um, or Joe used to maintain all that. And, and nobody actually thinks about um, reassigning those job responsibilities. Mm. I do think that's a really good reason why um, reviewing every year somebody's um, job responsibilities exactly what do they do so that you could then make sure that things are being done um and for those i mean i can remember as a, as like an employee as a staff member you always get very nervous about your end reviews and i don't think that's it's not necessary it, it's just really for management to make sure somebody is doing these things right. yeah right yeah excellent um okay okay so uh Again, no idea why. There we go. So for those of you who are like me, um, I'm not IT person, but being a business owner, um, I need to make sure my business and the, and the software that we develop is secure. Um, and I need visual aids. I don't mm -hmm. understand ones and zeros in codes. Mm -hmm. um, so this is the, the, the castle in France. Uh, it has a wonderful history that to me really is a great visual aid. It's built on a, on a high mountain. It had high walls. It actually had three um, kind of enclosures, okay. one within the, uh, the other. Um, so they, they, had, they built it with defense in mind. And um, they, they were seen, I'm not a history major, so I, I can't tell you the story, but you can, you can look it up. It is actually very interesting. And the people attacking, um, and you can see that here in the you know the little tower there. They were probably throwing rocks at them or something. Um, the in within the castle they had added a chapel. Uh, it would, I think it was in the second um, okay. kind of enclosure. And uh, when they built that castle, they decided to break through some of the walls to add light in. And what happened is the attackers were able to get through latrine tunnels 
which must have been okay. horribly unpleasant at the time. And then from there, get into one enclosure, and then from there, get into the chapel, and then from the chapel, get into. So as they were adding things after the original build, after the original defense plan was put into place, it kind of, um, um, you know, um, hurts the defense plan. And, okay. and of course, and it did come down in spite of all their efforts of, uh, of you know, thinking about their security. And to me, that is very much the defense plan of your information says You can have password policies, firewalls, spam filters. Um, you, you can have all these policies and procedures in place. You can have the right IT people, uh, but there's always going to be some potential weak points. And they have to be, you have to be looking at them all the time. And for those of you who are employees, um, and again, you don't have the responsibility for IT, you don't have the responsibility, just remember that this is the reason why your IT manager is probably uh, getting on to you for you know not having strong passwords in place. Mm -hmm. um, and we we are all a little bit um, you know we do have our, our like to have our the same password we use over and over again. Uh, I got uh, actually caught out yesterday, Wes. You know I realized that too that I was working with something with a consultant because we were working on um, the same system and he works on a different time zone. We kind of were sharing the same password and Wes was like nope can't do that anymore <laughs> so um i was like oh yeah i didn't even think about that you know so even so even if you're and that was on a marketing project so even marketing people you, you know you got to mm -hmm. think about right. how they could be doing something that might that could potentially impact your business so and, um, and what i really like about this analogy of a castle i mean there's a lot i like among these are that number one the idea here in looking at the picture you've got you're at war yeah there is an enemy mm -hmm. who is creatively thinking yeah. about how to get what they want yeah um, and they're going to do anything they will <laughs> go, go through, through the latrine they'll go through the latrine tunnels and to get, and get to that the crown jewel small price to pay yeah. for them uh, the other thing that i really like is that it's a combination of systems and people Okay, yes. there are layers of defense going on here. There are layers of attack going on here. But there's also must be some sort of politics going on in the general sense of the word, because you have the church who, as a as a group of people, says we need light to be let in. Mm -hmm. And therefore, let's compromise the defenses, which may be a fine business decision. That that it can, can be completely valid. You're, yeah. It's a you have to have a church and that type of time and that society that was an important part of a functioning castle. Right. And so it is the play of all of these things. And as a business leader, this is a true challenge. There is science to this, but there's also a lot of art. And I love this analogy. And it, it's very helpful as we think about what our challenge is and why, going back to your earlier point, which was we, we shouldn't necessarily think about this as a zero defect. This is a process. Defending the castle is a process that we must do all the time. I yeah. love this analogy. Yeah. And, and and you're right as far as like we had the conversation in one of our CEO groups too, I think it was in October, November, about we're wartime CEOs right now. Right. Um and and again, I you know, I'm a, I'm a again having been an employee for, for decades and then now running a business, um that's we have to remember our CEOs, our managing partners, they're not just dealing with compliance or cash flow or I mean we're dealing with supply chain issues, vendor risk, right. client risk, um, new regulations coming on board. Um, and the cyber risk is just one front that we're that they're fighting. Absolutely. Uh, and that their their troops that they're having to command is their IT team. But then they also need everybody in that organization doing their part. That's right. Uh, to support the IT team as well. So again, this is if that's the one thing I can tell people uh, who don't have that responsibility, just please remember, you've got to support the IT team as much as they kind of support you. That's right. um, and so just just please bear that in mind uh, as you're dealing with them. All right, next page. Okay, we've got two more polling questions. Let's see, where's my polling questions? There they are. And this is just to gauge, um, do you know some of the terminology? And I'll admit, three months ago, I did not know these terms so there's no shame if you do not know right. the, the 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 answers to these questions okay so uh basically it's do you know what a cve uh, and zero day do you know what that means 
and looks like we got some pretty good responses here. So you guys are a lot smarter than I am, that's for sure. All right, I'm going to give this uh, two more seconds. One, two, three. Okay, I'm going to close it out now. All right, and I will share the responses. You know, um, so yeah, so those two answered common vulnerabilities and exposures. That's correct. Right? Yes, okay, Absolutely. just double checking. Just double checking. That's right. All right, that is, and do you want to kind of explain what those are? Absolutely. Uh, CVE or both? Uh, CVE for now. And, and so a, a common vulnerability or exposure would be a known threat that the security community understands well enough to have codified it in our catalog right. uh, by the U.S. National Institute of Standards and Technology in what we call the National Vulnerability Database. Okay. So it's a known threat out there that your team can be looking for, which may or may not impact the business. Okay, and we'll discuss all that okay. later, absolutely. Okay, and next question, so I'm going to hide that. Next question is the term zero day. Um, asking you to, um, it's in, in relation to, to cybersecurity. And unfortunately, I can't read the whole question here, so I can't. Uh, yeah, uh, the term zero day in relation to cybersecurity, cybersecurity means, and of course, all right. So but again, we've got some good responses going on. Um, you know, you mentioned the CV as being, um, known and it's in a U.S. database. Do other countries have their own CVE list? That's a great question and I'll have to I'll have to look at that. Okay. I guess I'm so used to NIST and what I do know is that other countries do also use NIST and I believe that NIST would say that they're not only providing a service for the American people but... And NIST is N-I-S-T, right? N-I-S-T, National okay. Institute of Standards and Technology. Okay. It's a U.S. Okay. government organization. All right. Okay, we have some answers here. So I'm going to close that and let's see what we, we have. And uh, see, 30% of you say an attack is happening on your systems. 38% of the attack is imminent and we must secure our systems. 32% are saying it's a vulnerability is known, but no known. Uh, sorry, I can't read the whole, the whole answer there. Um, but the, it's the last answer. A vulnerability no, no, is known, no, there's no known fix, yeah. Um, I think you guys, the IT world, we call them patches. Is that a, what's the difference between a fix and a patch with these these zero day vulnerabilities? A fix could span not even doesn't even have to be IT related, okay. but patch usually refers to a software correction. Okay, okay. So so that's the difference between a CVE and a zero day. Uh, once there is a fix for a zero day, uh, then it becomes a CVE, right? Um, so a zero is so also a zero day, uh, there's two contexts for a zero day. Okay. There's sort of before the attack okay. and after the attack. Okay. Before the attack, when we say zero day, people don't even actually know, or at least the wider community doesn't know that it's even a problem or a vulnerability right. or a threat. Some Usually what happens is some group or some hacker group has found something and they're not telling anybody mm -hmm. and they're going to hold it in reserve and use it at the right time. Right. Um, once once people have experienced the, these level of attacks, we would then refer to a zero day as an attack that was previously unknown about. Right. And usually that also means that there is no known fix for it, but not necessarily so. It, uh, it, it could be that, for example, the log4j mm -hmm. vulnerability that we've been talking about, the, uh, the it was a zero day because to my understanding, people did not know that the vulnerability existed until attackers started using it. And then once we found out about it, it was actually pretty quick that the community found out, here's the fix for it. Right. So it's a balance. Why would the hackers who know about the vulnerability hold and not use it? Well, let's go back to the castle example. Okay. Surprise. A surprise attack is a great attack. Okay. And or they're waiting for that company to go through a merger and acquisition, or exactly. waiting for it to be Timing properly is funded if they've got a specific target. Don't okay. attack Russia in the winter. <laughs> That's true. I was actually just reading, listening to a podcast about they're saying that the ground's about to get wet, mm -hmm. and so the tanks won't be able to go through. Go. So it's like, okay, we're either not going to attack, or nobody's going to attack anybody right now. Or... Interesting. Okay. So uh, just to show you what uh, uh, CVE list looks like. Uh, and I know it's probably very small for some of you. Don't try bothering to read that. Um, you won't understand a word. I certainly don't. Uh, and of course, 
each line item in the blue uh, has its own page. And so that is what a CVE list. Now, you and I were chat chatting. I'm a bit of a task manager mm -hmm. uh, traditionally. I want to check my list to make sure everything's okay. I was, before I got to know you and, and your business and, and um, kind of your skill set, if I didn't know better, I would say, oh, okay, IT team, let's go through the CVE list and I want you to check and make sure we don't have any of those vulnerabilities. If you saw this list, it's thousands, if not maybe hundreds of thousands. Is that right? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, it just goes on and on and on. Um, your right. view is? Yeah, so my view is that to, to be a bit uh, general about it, let's say there's three types of organizations. There's one, there's organizations that don't even look at the catalog of CVEs. And and by the way, CVEs are something that your technical experts should be very familiar with, mm -hmm. and it's designed for your technical experts, okay? It's important for business leaders to understand that this is one of the tools that they're using. So there's organizations that don't even acknowledge or look at CVEs. Right. The next level, one of the next levels would be an organization that does, as you mentioned, let's go out and find any CVEs that apply to my organization and then as a good taskmaster, eliminate it. Eliminate it. And that's a decent, I would say though, then the next ascension of maturity would be to recognize that many CVEs actually don't impact your business right. or cannot practically be exploited by an attacker. And so then the next one is we say, well, let's actually talk about threats. And many threats actually don't require a CVE. So there's, if as a business leader, focus on what are the threats wherever from wherever they might come. And as a technical leader, be very versed in this to support your business leaders. Okay. I'm just gonna go back on the slide because I realized I okay. still had the polls up. So blocking that particular slide on the CVE. Um, right. Yeah, that's that list, uh, mm -hmm. just, just so people Catalog. can, can yep. see it, yeah. Um, and again, there's 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 just thousands, it's huge. Um, and this is kind of going, you know, you don't want to go through every CVE and have to eliminate it because you have this risk management process. Um, right, like, yeah. you know, like most things, that, when, I, when I talk to uh, executives and I do executive coaching, one of the main ideas I, try to make sure I communicate is that if you know how the payroll system works, if you know how to manage cash flow, if you know how to buy a car, if you know how to manage business risk, you are qualified to be a member of the cybersecurity team because cybersecurity is about risk management. And the most mature organizations in the world center their cybersecurity programs not around a certain tool or technology mm -hmm. or line of funding, they center it around a well-practiced, open risk management process that involves all parts of the business. Right. And so if you, if, if managers on any level follow this process, you will already be doing what better than 80% of, of organizations in the world, mm -hmm. in my estimation, because you are asking the right questions. Instead of being focused on as a taskmaster on, we must fix, fix this vulnerability, right. we must fix this. Business leader, apply some value to this process and say, I hear that there's a vulnerability, but what is, let's understand that threat. What could happen to the business? Mm -hmm. Oh, you say that X, Y, and Z could happen to maybe the operations department. Okay, next question would be, how likely is it that that will happen? Not all hacks are easy to attack. And then from there, now, if I, let's say, look at the dozen or so of these that we establish are real, what I love about this multicolored chart here that's on the right, I literally will just take each of those threats and just put them on that chart right. that anybody can understand how to use this chart. And from there, the answer becomes clear on which of these should we resource first, mm -hmm. under what priority, which of these are we okay accepting? How are we going to limit, transfer, or avoid each of these? Right. Sometimes the decision is we won't do anything, and that's okay. Just make sure you make that that call. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Right. And for those of you who are compliance officers, like you know, even client onboarding, we're we're already going through naturally this process. You know, you're, you you want to get rid of those clients that you know immediately right. are sanctioned or um, you know particularly high risk. You you just turn them down. You don't even start even onboarding them. 
those who do have some risk, you may accept them, but then you may limit what services, higher risk services that you provide to them. Um, um, those, if you do have some, uh, you might take them on. You, you might uh, do a bit more due diligence. Uh, you risk rate them. And of course, and then you can uh, choose to accept them or not. So we're, we're, it's a it's a little bit of the same process, right. though, so the same language. And, the, and this different. this what's on the screen takes many forms. Mm -hmm. This is just one example of right. such a process. So you kind of mentioned being on the the cyber risk board. Mm -hmm. um, would that so so you are you saying that you think that uh, kind of the heads of the different departments, HR and payroll. Um, AML compliance or the risk management team, um, but also <clears throat> I'm just trying. We have a, a vast different number of industries right. um, joining in today. So you know, I, you know, like, uh, but I'm just kind of thinking for the non banks mm -hmm. uh, specifically, they might want to have, or, or any industry, they might want to have like HR and payroll uh, advising on their their risks. And I think that what I've seen work well, and of course every organization has mm -hmm. to figure out how they're going to run a well-working risk management program and process. What I see is two layers of this that work very well. One that's a bit leaning more towards technical. So right. you might have a lot of people in the room who understand the technical impacts and, and things like that. This one I view as sort of a uh, preliminary uh, where what we really need to do in this process is identify the threats, that first step there at the top of the cycle, and make sure we understand the threats. Because our job coming out of this meeting is to go to the next venue, the next me meeting, excuse me, and help communicate that so that, the, so that the decision makers can make risk decisions. Who owns the risk? Yeah, we have that slide here. Beautiful. Yeah, that, that's part, right. of, part of your slides, yeah. And it's about bringing these three populations mm -hmm. together on the far right, security, IT, technicians, uh, engineers um, on the left, all the way at some point to the boardroom, the C-suite, the decision makers, whatever form that takes, and the sort of in between there. And so, you, uh, what I would suggest is the people that can make decisions or own the risk of something. Uh, if I'm an operations lead, I may own the risk of whether this operation will continue tomorrow or the next day, and I'm in charge of operational resilience. Perhaps I should probably be in this meeting because. Mm -hmm. Cyber is a part of everywhere in the business at, yeah. at some point, if you're a technology business. Even even information businesses. I mean, I'm thinking of lawyers and accountants. Right. I mean, every, they're, they're, if you every a business computer, is a technology. If you use a computer, right? <laughs> I mean, one of our, our uh, fellow members in our CEO group is uh, the whiskey, the whiskey brewer. Right. That, <laughs> and oh, yet right. Yeah, and yet we're a tech tech group. And, well, they're yeah, you know, and their and their facilities are run by, by technology. By technology. Exactly. So. It's interesting. Okay. So one of the giveaways we or you know takeaways we really wanted to make sure um, because I know ransomware is a is is a big worry for so many. I mean, the poll earlier um, showed that. And you you told me the other day three step plan. That's right. You want to explain a bit more? Right, right. And, 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 as, and I'm glad you bring up ransomware because one thing to take away from this is this is the sort of major threat facing people today is, is ransomware. There are plenty of other threats, ransomware being one of the most dangerous to any organization. So if you believe that you have been subject to a ransomware attack, which by the way, ransom is as old as that castle analogy. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and that's another reason yeah. I love that because it, the, the crimes don't change. It's just the tools they're using yeah. changes. So a ransom would mean that they're taking something of yours, preventing you from accessing it until you pay up. Right. Whether that's a whether that's a ransoming a person or data. So if you believe that you've been I think our data is more important these days than the average right. person. So maybe it, this is me being cynical. Hey, you know, that's a risk decision. You know, that's that's your risk decision. And so the first thing you should do, okay, if you believe that you've been ransomed, is number one, if hopefully you have already established ahead of time that you're going to have a response team, perhaps internally. Um, but also there are external response team that specialize mm -hmm. in this. And so I've had those phone calls. Somebody calls me and says, I've been ransomed. What do I do? And I say, relax, we're going to get through this. Yeah. And let's call 
you know, one of my favorite firms is one called GroupSense mm -hmm. uh, and Curtis Minder there who they are brilliant. They understand, I mean, it's so interesting. They understand how to negotiate with these ransomers who run in a ransomer, a, a, an attacker who's ransoming, it is remarkable. They run their organization like a business too. So it's about risk for them. Yeah. And they are totally open to negotiating that $5 million ransom down to however much it would be. Right. But, a, but, a, but an initial response team, somebody like GroupSense to come in and help you negotiate. They can do anywhere from negotiate to actually make the payment in which oftentimes is in cryptocurrency. Mm -hmm. Um, so they can do all that and handle it for you and help you get recovered. The whole point of all this is to keep the business going. So the small firms who don't have dedicated IT teams, mm -hmm. they want to find out if their IT consultants are response teams mm -hmm. or start shopping around. That's right. Or put, put, put one on retainer. Well, it's a beautiful thing. Who would you call? Do you know who to call? Do you know their Do you know their phone There's number? You. Right. <laughs> and then you're going to be. And I'm happy to do that. And, and that's why yeah. I have their numbers on speed right. because I'm happy to do that for people. Um, but right, think think through it. Just mm -hmm. like a business leader would. What if you had a fire? What if there was a natural right. disaster? What if there's a, a, a plant malfunction mm -hmm. or at a bank? What if there's a you know you have a response plan? Right. The next would be somewhere in there, and I would listen to your response team on this because um, at some point it's probably appropriate to contact some level of law enforcement. Right. In the in the United States, that tends to be the the Federal Bureau of Investigation, the FBI. Um, that is because you can get other resources. They see this a lot of times. They can help you, but but that is a business decision, um, and I would consult your response team on that. Um make a note because there is actually in some jurisdictions there's a reporting requirement if there's been that's a data true. breach so that's right and we, yeah right and, and as a part of your team you should be asking what am i required to do yeah and and within how because there's some of them it's like 72 hours or 22 that, hours that's right so yeah just just bear that in mind and, and that might be kind of worldwide depending on the data so it, it, it likely is i would be surprised if somebody doesn't have some reporting requirement but again that regardless that is still a yeah. business risk or business decision um and then the third thing is that it hopefully a part of your response and your risk mitigation plan includes some type of insurance. Mm -hmm. Not all cyber insurance is created equal. Right. And hopefully your insurance plan, you built it in so that there is some uh, ability for uh, some sort of ransomware related uh, coverage. Okay. Um, because oftentimes that can be where the payment comes from. But you should definitely check your policy. Okay. So the, these were after our discussion. I kind of added. So you've got the example of, of a response team, group sense. It could be your own internal IT team. Right. There and okay. um, again, I, I mentioned on the contact law enforcement. You may need to have a report to your local authorities. Mm -hmm. uh, you might have a time frame to report it. So make sure you've got that in your plan as well. Uh, and of course, your um, contact your insurance. Um, they might even have a ransomware hotline. Because I noticed when I was okay. looking at groups since um, their website, they actually have a hotline. Um, okay. And the other thing I would say too is make sure you print this stuff out. Because if you're locked in right. your systems, um, this might be something that you you put together your plan, you put the numbers down, you um, you know put it on one piece of paper, you laminate it, and it is on everybody's desks. Mm -hmm. And the other thing I was even thinking about is that. Um, it might be a little bit different for department or division or office. Sure. Uh, again, I, I kind of keep going back to the HR and payroll. Um, you know, they might have a different response person, and then because they're on a different server, and they have different tools. Right. Um, so, so those are you. You might have different ransomware recovery plans for for um, yeah checklist. And and detecting the issue can be one of the most important steps. Mm -hmm. And every person on your team in your company that's an opportunity that's a set of eyes and ears and so make sure you're you are allowing them to help you right do they know who to call right right um zero day threats action plans as soon as they are found okay. um so again you i guess you kind of monitor when these are first announced as a as a member of the security community we are always listening and as hackers we're always sort of in the deep dark corners of the internet trying to find those You're, next okay. attacks because that's our profession in a way but right, right. Mm -hmm. okay and this is a great and again this is um how uh foster and i really started talking is because again we're trialing the system and um you sent that email out about the log4j vulnerability mm -hmm. and 
again, I, I, you know, Wes was away. You gave me the language to ask, you know, developers and our vendors, hey guys, what's going on here? Do you know about this? You know, can you search, make sure we're not vulnerable? Uh, and it was like within four hours, I had all the responses back from various That's vendors right. and our software developers. So it was manageable. I had the right assurances. Um, and of course, and then we also had all the next steps as far as, okay, we're going to keep monitoring. We're going to keep looking because you've mentioned too, you can actually, um, search and, and, you know, with your system, you're kind of looking from the outside of all of our systems, okay. uh, but you don't find anything. I then kind of ask our vendors, do you see anything? And, you know, they might come back and you no, know, we don't use that language or whatever. Um, but it could be a tool within a tool within a tool or something like that. Right. Because you, you were talking to me the other day, even if you have a completely bespoke, customized, internally built system, you're still using somebody else's tools. That's right. All software is built upon somebody else's software. Mm -hmm. um, and and, and I, what I, what, I, I want to go back to the castle analogy if yeah. I can, because this is a great example of you are leading the charge on defense, but you're not an architect for a wall. Mm -hmm. You're not a master at whatever catapults or whatever are yeah. used here or the oil that you drip on people. Or load bearing. <laughs> right. But you know the questions to yeah. ask. And this is a big takeaway. You are using what we call um, in the moment or just in time or time sensitive risk management. You're saying to yourself, what is the threat? Mm -hmm. What could it do? Okay. What could it do? You've just assessed impact. Right. What could happen? Now you're saying, how likely is this? Where is it in the organization? Go find it, see if we have indications of it. And then accordingly, you allocate resources. Right. A bad news story that could have come from this is you learn about a problem and you put your team on red alert and you say, spare no expense, go change everything. That can be non-productive mm -hmm. because it could be for something that doesn't it, warrant that. We didn't even have that. And likewise, yeah. And likewise, the other thing, the other bad thing you could have done is just, oh, I'll ignore it. My security team knows They'll that. deal with it when they come back. Right. And that, and as a team, you provided a very valuable function in the security process. Mm -hmm. And that should be highlighted because I think a lot of people believe that, oh, I don't have an important role to play. Mm -hmm. And that's absolutely false. You can't have all the castle defenses doing what they think is best because they're looking here. You looked at the whole yeah. picture. And I think that's, that's the, the, the key. Thing that management has to realize, even though you right. don't have the IT right. background, you can still assess the risk and you right. know, get assurances uh, in a yeah, that's in a way that you know keeps your business operating. Um, okay, so we've got uh, another yeah. So that's what we were kind of talking here. Right. Uh, I'll skip over that one. Um, backups. Okay. Um, all right. So you get ransomware. Somebody might say, "Oh, we'll just wipe the server and let's get our backup." Pros and cons, I've laid out a few here. <laughs> you know, backups are essential. Um, the, the details matter on those. Um, the backups can mitigate several things, whether it's a natural disaster. They, they were very important early on in the ransomware, you know, one to two years ago, they remain to be important mm -hmm. uh, because what they can do is they can give you leverage. If they've stolen your data, you could at least say, well, I have another copy. Now let's hope you, you can't just have the backup. You have to be practiced at reconstituting that backup. Mm -hmm. This is a big part of your recovery plan. Be careful though now, because nowadays ransomers will, you may say, oh, well, I'm not paying because I have plenty of backups. And they may say, that's fine. Uh, I will go ahead and leak all this information to your competitors or get you into compliance trouble because, mm -hmm. and so, so they are essential. Consider on-site backups, off-site backups. They need to be periodic. And if you don't know how to restore the backup, it's not going to be any, any good. Either. And, and I also <laughs> recommend physical, physical backups, perhaps on a on a disc or something, right. because uh, a ransomer will also try to find your backups. And if it's connected to the internet, they may be able to get in there and steal your backups as well. Okay. So, so even the details. Because I I've had people say, oh well, my my backups are you know it's done automatically in, to the cloud. Yeah, you know, for instance, but do you say they could still? It's possible. Get in there? It's possible. And, and and you know, okay. So how do I manage all this detail complexity as a business leader? Uh, and maybe this is the Navy man in me mm -hmm. speaking, but I might pick a a weekend that I'm not telling my team, and I say, okay, team, overtime is authorized, and I want you to restore the backups 
at a, you know, within the advertised amount of time, let's say it's 12 hours, you've got until Saturday night to do it. Okay. Um, come tell me when it's done and show me that it works. Oh, your team loves you, I bet. <laughs> Stealing their weekends from them. I'm, I, I tell really great jokes. So, yeah. so I, I hope that <laughs> you happens. bring in the pizza, right? Right. Yeah, I'll, right. Bring, I'll bring the pizza and I'll be there with them. Right. right? Okay. Yeah. But, but let's show me that it works. And that, that matters. And that's a good learning experience too. Because even if things don't go right, they've learned you can do better next pick, time. Pick your pain. Do you want to have mm -hmm. pain now where we can control when yeah. we're going to have an, uh, what we call an exercise or a training moment? Yeah. Or would you all rather have your hair on fire when you're actually around? Yeah, yeah, that's true. Okay, and third-party risk, that is another. We're asked, obviously, because our system holds um, our licensees, you know, um, clients' data. So um, we're asked a lot, you know, mm -hmm. how do we know you're secure? Um, so we're currently going through the SOC 2 process, but, and I thought, that's good enough. Um, you know, we'll have that. We can say, yes, here, we've got everything. But having gone through the SOC 2 process, I realize now, um, or we're going through it, I should say, um, it's really just a snapshot in time. On this date, we were, we were good. And, and then we'll, we'll have to do that again, audit in, you know, a year's time. But we can still be doing everything wrong in between. So, uh, so talking to you, I kind of realized, oh, that's what, you know, these are good starting points. Right. Um, and I just don't know if you had any other, you know, uh, thoughts right. on, on this. And I think kind of two principles is every relationship you have with another company, mm -hmm. especially data relationships, imposes risk upon your own company. Uh, your software is created by somebody else. You have other third party risks. So you should be asking the question of people in your ecosystem, hey, let's talk about your security today. Mm -hmm. That's an uncomfortable, can be an uncomfortable conversation, but I've seen that the groups that do that are the most secure in the world. Mm -hmm. They get over the initial uncomfortableness and they ask that question. Sometimes the answer to that question may be, here's my compliance certification. Here's my such, here, here's my other proof. Um, and to your point, their um, compliance and certifications are important, mm -hmm. but but also keep in mind that compliance and certifications really just capture what we learned five to 10 years ago and are now mandatory. So you're working with something that five to 10 years ago, we knew you have to do. Right. So what that means is that it's important, but if you're not keeping up with your compliance, you're, you're almost certainly doing something wrong. Right. Hey guys, we knew you should do that five years ago. That's how important okay. it is. But if you're only doing compliance, you're probably also failing because as a risk manager, you need to say, okay, they showed me their SOC 2 or they showed me their PCI DSS. They showed me this other certification. Am I comfortable accepting that risk? Mm -hmm. That that's what they say. Maybe you go in a next step further and you say, when's the last time you had a penetration test? Mm -hmm. uh, vendor one, two, three. Um, do you do it continuously? Are you willing to talk to me about that? I'll show you. And, and just to kind of explain that, that that continuous pen testing is not standard right now. I think that's fair to say is that it's up and coming. But if you'd ask people one to two years ago, are you doing continuous pen testing? Mm -hmm. There weren't a lot of tools on the market to do right, that. Right. And, and again, that penetration, I, I think that's a term we haven't used yet or, right. or explained. Uh, and there is a, a checklist of, of kind of a terminology checklist as one of the handouts too that you know please print that out um, and, and that way you can kind of talk the talk. Uh, but penetration testing is when somebody from the outside is trying to push into your systems, penetrate your systems, mm -hmm. breach the walls, the castle walls. Uh, and, and specifically the walls, right? So let's take your castle example. Mm -hmm. A pen tester, in my in my belief, would not be able to have breach into the castle. You, a pen tester, you tell them, go knock on the walls. See okay. if you can find a way to break in. Okay. A red, so a red team. are eroding or something right. like that, yeah. The, and, and pen testing is very helpful and important, and you should do it. The next level is what we call red teaming. Think of it like if we were going to scrimmage in a, a sport, I would mm -hmm. put on a red jersey and you would be blue. Even though we're on the same team. We're on the same team, yeah. but I will pretend like I'm the adversary. Right. And, and you can and, find my weaknesses. That's right. And so a red teamer or a hacker would be able to breach into the castle because I'm not afraid to get in the latrine. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay. And All I right. won't. I won't. I won't just go knock on the on the walls. Okay. Okay. So those are the 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 
pen testing and red teaming are two different things. Mm -hmm. Pen testing Very and, related yeah. but different. Yeah. That's right. Okay. Uh, and as you, you kind of mentioned this before in conversations, you know, speed's relevant to stay ahead. Um, that, that's right. And I think that's why you, what you see is uh, people doing security well have recognized that doing a penetration test once a year mm -hmm. is not relevant. Hackers think in terms of days and weeks, sometimes mm -hmm. hours, but let's say days and weeks. So if you had done your penetration test eight months ago, and the, we were just talking about the, the recent hack called Log4J. Mm -hmm. If that one comes out, you would be six months behind by the time you looked at yeah, it. Yeah, because that was like December. Was it December right. that was announced? That's right, as I recall. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, and I was actually doing some research again for this and seeing that some, some people are doing quarterly pen testing. Mm -hmm. And I thought, oh gosh, if that went out in, in early December and they don't do their pen testing until uh, March, well, first of all, the pen testing might not, still might not be able to say hey you've got this vulnerability so pen testing it's itself limited. is not it's one tool yeah it's just one tool yeah i do like quarterly if you're not going to do it continuously um quarterly what i like about that is that it allows your team to get a third party look once a quarter mm -hmm. that doesn't mean your team stops trying to look for problems that part should be continuous internally mm -hmm. it's nice once a quarter i find that businesses are mostly on this quarterly schedule where it makes sense to do this um so i do like the quarterly okay if you can't do it continuous okay. All right. yeah. um let's see and of course again just a reminder speed is relevant mm -hmm. uh and you said this you said the log 4 j I, I was actually a bit uh, shocked when i heard you say it you said it was the most dangerous vulnerability in the last decade and that, and that, those aren't my words, but that's what I've been, a, a part of the security okay. community is saying that. Okay. Um, any reason, particular reason why that one's so? As I understand it, um, and I am not an expert on this particular one, but mm -hmm. just like a business manager, that's sort of the role I have mm -hmm. in my team of hackers. As I understand it, it is extremely easy for an attacker to conduct. Right. So the likelihood that I can achieve a breach is very high. And the impact that I can have is that I can essentially take over the entire computer right. if I find it. The other thing that hurts me is that it is so ubiquitous in all these systems that don't even know that they have it. So to me, as a hacker, this was a gift. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. And again, you, you, you I like the, that phrase you always use, security is a process, not a state. That's right. Um, I don't, anything you were going to cut? I think we pretty much... Um, you know, I think I think it's important for everything. I think it's important for technicians mm -hmm. to realize they need to answer the questions of the risk managers. Right. But let's also let me let me give a piece of advice. A, a common pitfall I see business leaders do is they sort of hands on the table and say, "When are we going to be secure? I want security. I gave you a half a million dollars last year. Are we secure yet?" Yeah. That's not the right. Right to think about. Yeah, exactly. Because it's not a state. You will not, on Tuesday, you will not achieve it. Yeah. Just like payroll and just like cash flow, it's a process. So treat it like a process. Okay. All right. All right. I think we're we're almost done and we're going to open up to, uh, yeah, Q&A. Here we go. Oh, yeah. Great. Um, so go ahead and use the, the question section. I'm going to do my best to monitor all this. Um, I saw we have some, some, uh, Hands raised, but that, those are. Oh, somebody says you will need to complete an STR. I can't tell when this one came in though, so I'm not sure if. What do you are you familiar with the term STR? Uh, I'm not, but I wonder if that was when, uh, and maybe the the person who asked the question should. Oh, if you had a, a breach, a breach, if you had a, a, a breach of, yeah, some kind of yes. Does that mean something in your? Well, to me, an STR, suspicious transaction reporting for banks. Um, so I don't know if somebody wants to kind of chime in and, and answer what if there's a if that's a term for for something. Uh, I'm just trying to see if I can go into the chat. And I'm happy to answer any type of questions. Mm -hmm. No question is a bad question. If you've ever wanted to ask a hacker a question um, or see yeah, how do they really them. wear the hoodies and that's right. sit in the only if it's cold out. <laughs> You know, if my ears are cold, I'm not going to wear You know, you might be wearing a hoodie and drinking that Red Bull. That's right. <laughs> But oh, but the, but you know that that caricature is is interesting. Do we okay. do we look like we have some questions? Yeah, we do. Okay, so some of them are people saying we couldn't hear anything. Sorry, I do apologize for that technical glitch. Okay, somebody says I'm going to read through some of these. How about individuals being targets? 
to steal their digital identification so as to set up accounts as part of the AML layer process. Um, okay, sorry, I, that, that was, so I mean, yeah, of course, a, a I, individual could be a-, a and, and what I hear from that is, oftentimes the easiest way for me to hack into a system mm -hmm. is to make the system believe I'm somebody who's supposed to be there. Right. And, um, and so whether I send an email to trick somebody, mm -hmm. maybe I spend three months establishing trust with somebody during a merger and acquisition. Mm -hmm. Hey, this is Bob from the new company. We're supposed to merge together. Go ahead and give me all your passwords. Go ahead and tell me where you log in. I know we got to do this. <laughs> okay. And then I earn your trust. And then all of a sudden I masquerade as you perhaps the system. And that is where your low level support staff could be not your IT teams mm -hmm. or your management, but your, your support staff could be very vulnerable. Um, and, but also could be your greatest asset as mm -hmm. well. Hey, is this Bob guy mm -hmm. from the new company, is that real? Yeah. Um, or pick up the phone or, or however, but, but this highlights the, the point that individuals are a very vulnerable part of the, of the system. A lot of secure organizations will use tools to help monitor either certain transactions or certain behaviors of people on the system. So that why is Bob from the new company logging in at 2 a.m. Mm -hmm. on a Sunday? It may not make sense for that business. Right, right. Um, and I also, you, I, I kind of wanted to point out, because I don't think we talked about it too, with red teaming, it's not just, they're not just going in from a code in cybersecurity. They could be contacting the manager. They could be making a phone call and making that personal contact. That's part of the red teaming process isn't it red teaming means almost there's there's, there's no, no, rules no rules other than don't hurt the client yeah because i am actually on your team mm -hmm. so that means i'll find the latrine That's okay right. all right um okay so maybe she's not seeing slides all right sorry just did you ever get caught being a hacker um well because you were working for the mm -hmm. government <laughs> So, what are the consequences? Oh, that's a good question. What are the mm -hmm. consequences to the hackers? Have you, have you known any hackers on the other side who got caught? So um, as a hacker, there are different, it depends on what I'm trying to do as a hacker. Mm -hmm. I, I'm not always trying to steal something, but if I'm trying to steal something, oftentimes I prefer to not get caught because that just makes the job easier. Right. If I can steal once and I don't get caught, maybe I could come back next week and steal something else. However, some hackers, their goal is to, let's say, destroy something. Mm -hmm. Uh, and in that case, maybe I don't care about getting caught. Um, a lot of techniques that hackers will use are so they don't get caught, like anonymization. It's actually, it turns out it's very difficult to identify a hacker, either who they are, but from where they're coming. Uh, if we use the analogy of, let's say a bank robbery, um, the attacker is wearing full masks, you can't identify them, uh, and they change their form. They walk in, they look like, a tall man, they walk out, they look like an old lady. Right. So, and usually how, how those bank robbers are found is, is not from the identi identification of the robber, but where the money was spent. There you go. And then you're following the money and there, there is going to be another webinar. About, and of course, cryptocurrency yeah, is yeah, how they mask yeah. that. Yeah, exactly. Um, so are there, are there consequences? Is I, I would leave it up to your jurisdiction, but certainly there are, if you can catch one, mm -hmm. but I would just say don't ever plan on catching one. Yeah, interesting, interesting. And is it true in the movies where you do find the, the bad guy and they just put him to work in the FBI or something? Certainly, certainly <laughs> that's true. Is that too much information? Well, yeah, it's, <laughs> it's, it's happened. <laughs> well, no, but it's a great principle. If you want to catch a thief, hire, hire a, a thief. thief. Exactly, exactly. Okay, um, somebody's asking, oh, uh, oh, yeah, I was, I was about to say, this is definitely a compliance officer, and I recognize the name, it is. What would you suggest be the main subjects to the table of contents for cybersecurity policy? And so having written plenty of these mm -hmm. and, um, and worked with teams to craft these, um, there are some standard best practices, and I think that's a bit of a longer answer that, um, but it's, it's going to center around how your business works, but also the sort of five phases of principles. What are we doing to identify, protect, yeah, detect, that's... respond, and recover? The NIST cybersecurity framework is one that I really like because it goes through five phases of, if you do these five things, these are the elements of your castle defense, so to speak. Um, but policy also governs things like the way 
the rules people have. Mm -hmm. It should also include your incident response plan or at least a reference to it. It's going to be your guidebook for how people that they should know that if they do these things, uh, they will achieve security. And certainly in there should be risk management. You should be giving, uh, depending on the purpose of the policy um, and where it's written in the organization, maybe you're identifying what the risk management process is, who's in charge of it, how it's resourced, what authority they have. Okay. You know, you're so built the, the accountability, who's accountable. Accountability, authority. Um, these documents should be really things that your team will actually read as well. And so short and sweet, if you can. What are the questions? So let's say you get hacked and the hackers are asking for five million. And let's say you don't have insurance. Okay. Um, and if you don't pay, they're going to release your data. <clears throat> You've got high net worth clients. Mm -hmm. You know, you're, you're going to lose your business because, you know, you, okay. you know. Um, should, should you also kind of plan ahead how the board uh, or managing partners decide do we pay, how much do we pay? I mean, how, how are we going to, you know, who's going to be responsible for coming up with that money if they don't have it mm -hmm. in the bank? Like, are all the, are all the owners of the business, mm -hmm. or, you know, I mean, is that, is that something they should be thinking about too, or is that kind of? I think that would be wise. And, you know, it's, it's to what level you want to explicitly write these things mm -hmm. out. But certainly in your ransomware response plan or incident response plan should be if we need money mm -hmm. to pay. solve the problem. It could be to solve the ran uh, to, to pay the ransomer. It could be to um, it could be because I need fifty thousand dollars right now to do some re risk recovery. Mm -hmm. You know, we also need a budget during an incident. So where is that money coming from? What department are you sharing? You know, some organizations okay. share the resourcing on okay. some of these things. All right. And it, it, just to kind of go back, you said you there's there's like a top five, and I, I got detect, respond, recover. Is that or uh, is identify? Identify is the first, okay. and then protect. Protect. Mm -hmm. Okay. So identify, we want to know what the threat is. Protect, okay. we want to make some pro proactive measures to prevent. Prevent. prevent yeah. So don't prevent. Yeah. Detect is important. Detect says, how do you know if something bad is actually happening? Okay. Uh, is the castle being attacked right now? Okay. And then uh, somebody crawling through our the trees. Right. Yeah. Right. Respond would be let's send the archers out there and 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 what have you. How am I going to respond to this? Who who comes to the table? Okay. Recovery is ultimately the most important part. If you do nothing, if you do none of those five steps, have a recovery plan, because the whole point of security is to support the operation mm -hmm. and the operational resilience of the organization. Okay. So, so I always suggest that. So identify, protect, detect, respond, recover. Mm -hmm. So those are your kind of five starting points for any. These are the NIST cybersecurity framework. Okay. Uh, which has an excellent, uh, you know, free to use. It's not a compliance standard, but many compliance standards are based on the National Institute of Standards cybersecurity framework. Okay. Yeah, so you can go, they can go to that website and actually do a little bit more mm -hmm. research. I believe to... it's nist.gov. Okay, fantastic. All right, um, what would you expect to see on cybersecurity reporting logs at a board meeting? That's interesting, that's a good question. So reporting slash logs um, at a board meeting. something that we do. Now we're a small company. Now we, mm -hmm. we, we use the uh, a specific tool for random password generator. And the other thing okay. it does is it gives our password health. Okay. Um, and anybody who drops below 94 mm -hmm. is West knocks okay. on our door <laughs> because he monitors like that. that. That's good. That's some yeah. good detection uh, mm -hmm. that you're detecting that there's a particular weakness. Yeah. And um, so, so anybody who drops below 94, we're, you know, he, he, he wraps us on the knuckles. Uh, if we are a bigger company, I would see something like that being useful. So you could then identify your staff who are not, if you have that tool, because that's the only way, I mean, you have to have one of those tools. And, and, and I think there are key metrics that you would want to show the board because you want, what I, what I would say is, and I carry this around with me all the time. I, at a board, yeah. you show the risk chart. Okay. Oh, that's a good idea. Here are the threats. Yeah. Here's how we've addressed and, them. And just in case uh, they're not seeing us and they're seeing, okay. that's that, uh, the colorful chart. Um, yep, there you go on the right go. side. Yeah, take that chart and, Present that to the board with your analysis. I consider that chart to be the Rosetta Stone mm -hmm. of cybersecurity. Everybody understands it, and everybody can rally around it 
to make decisions around it right. um, and understand what risk you're going to accept or not. And I, I hope that gets to the uh, the question there. Okay. So when he did ask, they they just left. Do you have a cool hacker name, or is Do it I secret? <laughs> I, uh, so I would say that uh, a lot of people on my team, I think they've got theirs and, you know, in respecting the anonymity. Yeah. <laughs> okay. All right. Um, somebody makes the comment, cybersecurity attacks are treated as a form of terrorism in some jurisdictions. Um, yeah. I think uh, that's right. Well, at least it's it's probably um, the ransomware is probably funding terrorism. Did you ever have any kind of experience with... So you know terrorist groups or again well I fought or I we call it counter piracy right and I've worked against pirates who take people's ships at gunpoint right and ransom them and uh, certainly uh, ransom is a very effective uh, form of attack right um, have I, I, I my expertise is not in particular in the incident um, phase of ransomware but uh you know i have coffee with those people all the time. right right all right well that seems to be the the questions from the from the crowd um we are at the top of the hour i was just going to kind of look at any of these questions um oh i one question because i do have some clients who do rely on old legacy systems okay and the legacy system means there's no active developers there's no updates and maintenance what do you tell people who have those, you know, I mean, do, are they just going to have to go find a developer to, or somebody to update them? You know, there's one question okay. to rule them all and no. whether they're looking at the slides <laughs> or not. The first thing I'd say is, what's the what? potential impact yeah, okay. and what's the likelihood of that? Yeah. Some, some, I, I understand legacy systems in the, in the industrial world, which is very much the U.S. Navy, we uh, coincide with legacy systems all the time and we ask that question mm -hmm. and so some of them your decision will end up being okay i accept that there might be this type of risk there but i also accept because there's an operational risk to moving right. a legacy system mm -hmm. uh, in manufacturing and i'm sure in financial transactions and whatnot there's a real risk of quote upgrading that legacy system okay because it, the new one might not work as well right that's interesting so i do not think about don't that. just consider the cyber risk Right. consider operational risk. the operational risk here. okay all right good um we talked about backups already um what about, what about all these you know we're cloud solution um their silo mm -hmm. is um mm -hmm. do 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 our do customers need to uh, are, are people are businesses that are using various cloud solutions what do they need to do, if anything? Or do are they relying on the cloud uh, service provider, kind of like how we did, you know, in December? Mm -hmm. um, or again, maybe you know, like they're everything's on AWS, or everything's mm -hmm. on Azure mm -hmm. servers. Mm -hmm. What do they? What, what questions should they be asking? Well, <laughs> <Back to. laughs> let's get to the operational and yeah. and security risks. Okay. So, so. Um, there's trades in all of this. There, there's an advantage, some of the advantages of going to the cloud, which to be plain about it is the cloud we need to just recognize is your data on somebody else's computer. Sorry, yeah. And that's fine. And that and there's there's utility to that because they tip they tend to specialize in data transfer and storage. Mm -hmm. And that can be very helpful. Um, but operationally, there can be a risk in that because that means that you aren't fully in control of your data. And maybe you're willing to accept that risk. And people that go to the cloud, whether they know it or not, are accepting the risk that they don't control their data on their premises, mm -hmm. which may be fine and could actually be a benefit. Uh, Security-wise, understand that to me as a hacker, when I think of the cloud, um, consider two types of castles, an organization that stores their own data on their own premises. When I go to that castle, the castle looks different every time. Yeah. And I and some of it in the initial time, I'm trying to figure out even what this castle do they even have latrines? Right. To yeah. use the castle analogy. Okay. When they go to the cloud, they're using a template on how to use on um, what their castle looks like. So to me, the castle is familiar. Mm -hmm. That can be both good and bad. If it's a familiar castle to me, if it's a fam familiar security, I might say, "Ooh, this one's really tough to get into." And like back off. 
But then I might also say, but I've done it before. Oh. <laughs> so I know how. All right. I know where the latrines are. Um, so there's a trade there. Okay. Um, security and operations. Right. Somebody has just um, posted. This was a, a question. This was a conversation you and I had oh, on right. Monday. Okay. Mm -hmm. It's illegal. The, the the statement is it's illegal to pay hackers as they are criminals. And you and I and I kind of was kind of coming at it from a anti money laundering. It's like mm -hmm. you know if I was a bank. Mm -hmm. And I suspected that my um, customer, my corporate customer, who's suddenly asking a bunch of questions about, you know, cyber, you know, cryptocurrencies and having to pay something of, you know, a million dollars in, in Bitcoin. I'm a compliance officer and I, I would have to, my thinking is I would have to file a suspicious activity report because to me that is money going to pay a ransomware. Mm -hmm. That's my suspicion. Mm -hmm. And ransomware is illegal because it's crim criminal, just exactly as, mm -hmm. as this person states. You had a different take on that. Right. And so, of course, the question of is it illegal, that, of course. It's jurisdictional, I right. guess. I, I think yeah. that would matter. However, I don't know of a place mm -hmm. where it is illegal it's to pay a ransom. It's not illegal in the U.S.? Uh, I, I don't. I haven't kept up with it within the last couple of weeks. Okay. But <laughs> last so time unless something's it. changed. Yeah. No, it's not illegal. I think that some discourage it, but I don't agree with that discouragement. Here's why is because when we talk about your business, mm -hmm. your business is your life. Mm -hmm. It's the lives of the team. It's the lives of your employees. Right. And so that life should be protected. And I think of it in a perhaps a principle of self-defense. And I believe it's my understanding that that's currently how U.S. law thinks of it as well, where um, the ability to pay a criminal, a ransomer, mm -hmm. is one of your tools of self-defense. And if they are saying that We're we will destroy you that unless shield. you pay, yeah. you know, it's the same thing that if, if somebody was holding me at gunpoint or robbing me, mm -hmm. of course you give them the money. Mm -hmm. You give them the money. Now that still is a business decision. Um, you, you see it that way, yeah. You, your third party advisors can help you understand what is the real risk, but I, uh, my personal philosophy is you, it would be very bad for us to remove people's ability to do that because you're removing somebody's ability to defend themselves and protect their business. Mm -hmm. So, um, to the best of my knowledge, it is not, it is not illegal. Yeah. And I encourage you to be able to do that. Should you decide to do it? I wouldn't jump straight to it as your first method That's, of recourse. It, it's interesting because, because again, putting myself back in the compliance office, the bank compliance officer's shoes. I can see that being a real issue. I mean, a real problem because I, because because what happened in a in my experience, if you file a suspicious activity report, you're not supposed to uh, move any money. Everything's supposed to stop, you know, mm -hmm. without tipping okay. off the the person mm -hmm. um, that you filed a suspicious activity report, and that suspicious activity report goes through a, a financial reporting unit, and then they are supposed to get back to you and let you know. Yes, you can. It's a dilemma. Yeah, it's a dilemma because, and then if if you've got a, a hacking situation, a ransomware situation, and that company has 24 hours to pay that million dollars, and you filed a suspicious activity report, suddenly the bank cannot send out the money. What I, however, what I would, it's almost a liability issue. Well, what I would, that's true, and and that's a good thing to think. Could the bank be liable? Things I, to think about, board. So <laughs> ironically, yeah, ironically, ransomers and criminals. Are actually very professional okay so i don't mean so your response team would be able to negotiate say hey yeah. look you know this is probably going right. to get a suspicious activity report right one of the first questions that's yeah. asked or in this negotiation or in this yeah. conversation the ransomer wants to know what's your ability to pay yeah um i forget the exact technical details but i it reminds me of a story i heard during a an older ransom attack where somebody calls the hotline the, uh, by the way, the ransomer has taken over the system right. and says the only way to get your data back is call this hotline. These ransomers have set up a call center with professional people wow. in their language. This was a worldwide event. Okay. Somebody with, in some language that I don't recall called them, had very customer service for and said, how are you today? How can we help you? Are you here to pay? And the person said, look, you've asked for, I don't know, let's say it was, it was, small, it was a small individual. So I think it was something like $500 and right. they say, in 500 US dollars is my entire two year salary. I cannot pay. And so the first thing they're assessing is ability to pay. The, 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 the customer service representative at the ransomer says, 
how does fifteen dollars sound? Something like that. Get a little discount. <laughs> right, and it says absolutely, and so that type, and so not knowing a lot about your industry, and I would definitely. Uh, that's a tough dilemma and maybe think through that, but knowing just that element, I would say, don't worry, there is a, there is a negotiation, there's a conversation that can have in those mm -hmm. situations, as I've learned it. it, may not be, but this is, you should ask your third party, you know, that number you're going to dial, Who's call them experience? now before you're ransomed to say, what would our plan be? How okay. should I think through this? Okay, mm -hmm. interesting. All right, so that was a very good, like I said, I can, I can see question. that that issue of bank tellers you know and mm -hmm. bank compliance teams having to report suspected ransomwares i, I can see that being a, a liability issue for the bank that might have to think about too because if right. they hold off on that transaction and then suddenly that data is released mm -hmm. by their customer is the bank liable so but that's a, again a whole new different ball game and these are great things liability. to think through yeah. and, and have a playbook for it yeah, absolutely. Okay, Foster, I think we are done. Um, again, there are a couple more slides here. I, I really appreciate it. Like I said, I do learn so much from you every single conversation. I'm Likewise. so glad you, you joined our, our CEO group. Um, this is their website, breachbits.com, mm -hmm. correct? Uh, if you want to know more, you do offer a uh, continuous penetration testing? I, I would say monitoring? really what we, we help people understand their own risk. Mm -hmm or the risks of others. Okay. And if you think about us like a credit rating agency, okay. we're gonna help you understand your own cyber credit score, your okay. cyber risk score, or those of those in your in your ecosystem. Right, right. Uh, we happen to do that and know what we're talking about because we're hackers, right. and so we okay. do that as well. So you can learn a lot more, um, like I said, as you, you see here, friendly guy, he can tell you. And, and who's your partner, Jeff? Uh, John Lundgren John. is, is, is co our co-founder. Oh, okay, okay, mm -hmm. fantastic. Uh, so yeah, so uh, do reach out to Foster, um, and his email is on the. Um, there is also somebody who is uh, giving a cyber risk assessment masterclass. I think it's based out of the UK, 27th of January. There is an um, exam you have to take as well. So if you, if anybody is looking for any kind of uh, certification, um, you know, feel free to to reach out to them, and there there is a handout for that as well. And our next webinar for AML Gray Matters is with William Callahan of Blockchain Intelligence Group. And uh, he's going to be talking about cryptocurrencies uh, and blockchain for uh, compliance officers. We may even get into, he, he used to be a DEA agent and um, had to do cryptocurrency investigations for drug deals. Um, wow. So should be another interesting. I'll probably be dialing into that one. <laughs> exactly, should be another one. Yeah, put some good questions in as well. Um, but yeah, so so please do join us. And I did put the link in the chat as well. Um, so